Coach, many times after these tough losses this season, you've talked about how you haven't seen quit in your team. Yeah. As you go into the offseason, is that one of the, the key positives that you kind of take from the season? Yeah, you, you try to grasp on to anything positive that you can. And uh, the way they fought, and you look at certain positions, you, you look at, you go segment by segment and see what you have in, uh, in the kennel. And uh, trust me, we're in the process that this is Coach Ray, this is his time, this is his moment, this is where he excels. This is where the scouting department, uh, Corey, this is where they start doing their thing. We, we already know what's gonna come probably in the next few days to a, a week and a half. We already know what's gonna transpire. You, just, you guys are just gonna, you're gonna be pleased with, with what's coming. I promise you that. Another emergency buff stampede radio out of Mr. Tiger, joined by 104. Three, the fans, Matt Smith. Matt, we haven't even gotten up all the episodes recapping the 2023 season, and we've already got huge news. You were live on the air today when Jordan Seaton, the number one ranked offensive tackle in the country, verbally committed to Colorado. We're, we're right in the middle of a Broncos segment, and up on my timeline pops the news. And I almost couldn't even think about wh what we're talking. Russell Wilson, what? Sean Payton. Okay, great. That's wonderful, Mike. Uh, by the way, something massive just happened here. I was stunned, Adam, because over the last week and a half, it seemed pretty realistic that he was off to Ohio State. I mean, he 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 was denying the report that was, you know, I guess unsourced. I mean, maybe sourced, but not coming from like a legitimate outlet. There was some random Twitter account that posted it and he shot it down. He's like, oh, you you found out that I was going to Colorado, did you? And then, you know, fast forward to like 72 hours later, there was a top six revealed from his original top seven, but it did not include Colorado in the graphic. So I think automatically we assumed, all right, well, he's had enough of Buff fans getting on him on social media. He's just going to go ahead and move on here and eventually announce what a curveball, man, and what a game changer. This changes everything. It really does. And that's what I said on air today. I said, I don't want you to seem like I'm overreacting, but this legitimately changes everything. And if you thought Prime was keeping receipts after the, you know the TCU game, if he had a presser today, he would be in rare he would be in rare form. What an awesome day to be a Colorado football fan, and what a massive day for this program, Adam. My guess is that Jordan Seaton has a good sense of humor, and that's part of yeah. why. Colorado was not included in his last of top schools because uh, this was not something that changed in the last couple of days. He was leaning towards Colorado and there weren't a whole lot of people that knew it. Uh, you know, this is a staff that even though coach <laughs> coach prime will come out in a press conference and say, we got big news coming. Um, you know, the rest of the staff does a pretty good job of, of playing it close to the best. They, they were very similar uh, with Cormani McLean, it, it's the big fish. They don't want to spook them by. Uh, mm. And so it was Jordan Seaton's idea not to have Colorado included in his list of top schools. Uh, what was that about a day and a half before announcing his commitment to Colorado? Uh, you know, you don't really ever expect a true freshman to come in and, and dominate on the offensive line, but Jordan Seaton might be the exception in terms of those expectations. I don't know if you got a chance to see him at when he was on campus for his visit, but he's just built differently. And this is a guy that actually has lost quite a bit of weight that uh, it was kind of the opposite process of some guys that are developing into their body. He has gained a lot of quickness by going from about 330 down to 287, but at 287.65, he still looks gigantic and has a, a really solid base and there's just some guys at 6'5 287 could be pretty slender or in his case he is rock solid and so um that I, I don't want to put too much on an offensive lineman coming in but uh you know this is a guy that has a versatility that it sometimes is, is easier to transition a guard and so maybe even though he has the length that he would be very successful being a tackle and he's got the the quick feet that would allow him to do that i think a, a six six foot ten wingspan but uh if you need to put him in a guard right away i think that might be a quicker transition until he kind of gets his feet wet you saw that with ryan miller when he came in as a five-star right. recruit at colorado yeah i was just watching seaton's uh huddle and his film and just kind of refreshing myself now that you know this is even a, re a reality right I, before i was just like ah you know i 
I, I just I think it's probably my years and years and years of being around the program that I just don't expect good things to happen until they do. Then I'm proved then 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 you prove it to me when it actually happens. But that was one thing that I was going to ask you, because you clearly have a better depth of reference about this kid in general. I was looking back at some of his St. John's film and it looks like he was playing guard. So he has some experience doing both things. And you mentioned athlete. I mean, he was they even had him pulling from the tackle position. And when he's pulling from a guard, you he just pops off the page with his athleticism. This is a road grader. This is somebody who finishes blocks. He'll fi- I, there was one play where he f- where I think they snapped the ball offensively at like the 35. He finished his block in the end zone. He shoved the kid all the way back. Like Colorado doesn't have that type of talent or hasn't had that type of talent. And okay, as a incoming freshman coming out of high school, right? You don't really expect that guy to maybe contribute heavily. I don't know if he's necessarily going to be your left tackle right out of the shoot. Maybe he is. They have an opening there, but he'll probably be in the conversation for it, Adam. I don't know if they're going to trust a true freshman there, but I mean, he has just as good a chance of anybody that they're going to bring in the way I see it. I mean, and, and I jotted down a few notes here. I, I what I say, he generates push. He moves guys mm-hmm. off the ball for the love. How long have they needed that? Right. He finishes. And he's got great technique. Like you can tell, like you, you could see him use like some ghost hand in there. He was, he, he's polished more than you'd see a high school offensive lineman. And I, I mean, to me, this seems like the domino, the domino that falls that will lead to not only other commits, but more attention and everything from there. Yeah. And that, that seasoning at IMG Academy is going to matter. I mean, those guys are, Basically, they've started kind of that transition to what college life is going to be like. And uh, I I think it says a lot about Jordan Seaton's mentality that he's signing up for this, right? Because there's going to be a lot of attention on him. I don't think – I can't imagine there's going to be a freshman offensive lineman in the country that has more of a spotlight on them. Oh, no. Year. But yeah. <laughs> Jordan Seaton has enough confidence that – he's going to live up to any of those expectations. And so uh, there's probably not going to be a press conference that goes by early on when Jordan Seaton gets on campus as an early enrollee where, you know, coach prime is not being asked about him. That's the type of spotlight he's walking into, but it's also a great opportunity from an NIL standpoint. And um, just, you know, just for his development, I think having that pressure on him Mm is going to continue kind of that accelerated process that he got at IMG Academy. And that's clearly uh, important for any guy that that's willing to go to IMG Academy, because you got to give up a lot of, you know, the freedoms of being a you know high school student when you do that. So uh, I, I'm really anxious to see how this plays out. Um, I, I certainly don't think there's ever such a thing as, as a can't miss. I mean, I thought Daryl Scott was that, but okay. Jordan Seaton is, and I don't want to put him in that category. That's not fair, but this is about as can't miss a, as a high school offensive line recruit can get, I think. I mean, and when you're checking off the offseason wish list, and we went through it all together in our you know end of season recap about what they need for next year, protecting Shadur is number one. And actually, this morning on with Mike this morning on the morning show, Mike said, do you still believe? He was asking me. I was like, I don't know if it's really you know my job to believe one way or another, but I'll tell you this. You find a bunch of big dudes who can come protect Shadur. I'll start really believing is what I said. A couple hours later, they got probably the biggest fish left on the market. And I mean, Adam, I just I look at this as a turning point, maybe for this program, potentially like we could look back and go. Remember when they landed Seton and then everything that that followed. Right. This is one of those moments here for Coach Prime and. For the staff, I mean, what a massive win for them to go up against Bama and Ohio State and Tennessee and Oregon and win for an offensive lineman. I mean, that's new territory. We've never been there before, Adam. This is huge. And you got to wonder if it had anything to do with the timing of hiring a new offensive line coach, which I guess kind of got made official last night. Brian was the first one, I think, with that officially. So, I mean, Phil Lodeholt comes over. You're talking about a bit of a younger guy. You feel like he could probably relate fresh off the NFL. He's got the experience with Pat Shermer having been in Minnesota. I I would imagine that, sorry, as Jordan Seaton, you have an opportunity to go anywhere and get a big bag of money. 
But it's more than that. If you want to go to the NFL, you got to make sure that your position coach is somebody that you're going to be able to learn from and tolerate, right, for three years. I think about different position coaches. O-line coaches can be some of the, you know, most red ass of the bunch, right? I mean, these guys can light you up. You never know. Some of them are, they got their wires crossed, Adam. They're a little tapped, right? And so you got to know that you can trust that guy. And I think that probably played a big factor in it. I don't know. You probably know better than I. Well, I've just really enjoyed a lot of the personalities of the offensive line coaches that they've hired that have just been wildly unsuccessful. So, (laughs) you know, they're always a bunch of fun one way or another. You know, I will say Chris Kapilovich, he did a great job with that group when he was part of Mel Tucker staff. And, um, you know, he loved Boulder and would have stuck around, but. You know, he was being offered the assistant head coach job at Michigan State. And at that point, he didn't know who Colorado's next head coach would be. You don't know if you're going to mesh with that person. He felt like he couldn't turn down that job in East Lansing. So, uh, but aside from that, it's 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 kind of like with the, the Coy Detmer thing of how is it since 97, since they've had a quarterback drafted? You think just the stars would align with, you know, a, a better offensive line coach here recently or, you know, quarterback. And, and now it seems that they have that with Shador Sanders and um, he's going to be playing for that draft stock next year. And now can Phil Lodeholt be that that saving grace that they need? Because um, I talked about the pressure that Jordan Seaton going to feel. I mean, Phil, Phil Lodeholt has to know coming to Boulder that uh, all eyes are on him in that group uh, in, in these coming months. And, I don't know what didn't work with Bill O'Boyle. He seemed like a really bright guy. And I think part of it was maybe the evaluation factor from his experience at being at, at a mid-level in, in just not really knowing the, the athleticism and the overall sheer strength that you need as an interior offense alignment at the Pac-12 level. And maybe that's why guys like Wilty and Bailey didn't make that jump. Whereas, you know, if he was coaching at some of his previous stops at a lower level, mm-hmm. That's why, you know, he was more successful with that that type of blue collar lunch pail guy and, uh, and just didn't have quite the eye to evaluate the right talent for this level. But um, Phil Lodehold played at, at OU. He played, uh, you know, on, on one of the best offenses with Sam Bradford in college football history. Right. Um, and, and he's got a good story, too. He was actually committed to Colorado coming out of high school south of Colorado Springs, and then had to go the JUCO route, academically ended up at OU after being a two-year junior college All-American. So um, he's he's been from, you know, getting humbled coming into college to playing on one of the best college football teams. So you like the, the uh, re- relatability that he has with these college kids, because no matter where they're coming from, he's probably been able to share uh, in some of the experience that they've gone through by the path that he took, which was maybe a little bit more unconventional. Right. And so clarify this for me. He went to high school in Colorado, but he's not from Colorado, right? I don't At know if I, this is, I think is so. armor, army brats. Okay. To say, right. Yeah. yeah I think, yeah, he moved, yeah. I think he moved around a lot. I think is what okay. Happened. Okay. All right. Yeah. I wasn't sure, but that makes a lot more sense now, but I, I will say, You spent four years as an analyst, right? One of the things that we talked about in our season recap, at least I have his credentials, right? Four years as a power five offensive analyst, correct? One of the things that we talked about in our season recap was finding a rock star offensive line coach. And one of the things that, you know, William Gardner lamented was that they hadn't really hired a guy who has done it at the power five level and had legitimate success that you could point to now as an analyst i you know i I, look it's it's tough for me without knowing the guy or knowing that program intimately just how much of a role he had there but i think i just think that we would be remiss if we didn't mention that he's never been an o-line coach actually done it before right so he's gonna have a hell of an opportunity now with the number one offensive tackle for 2024 you know under his belt so just something to keep in mind there that that while I think I don't know how much of a of a role he had in actually landing Seton but I'm sure it was significant enough because if Seton wanted to go somewhere like Bama or you know Oregon or Tennessee or wherever I mean he'd have gotten a bag and had probably gotten an established offensive line coach so we'll see how it all plays out I think I also wonder how much of it was the connection with Shermer like how much of that was based on Pat's recommendation. And I think one of the things that we've seen is prime. And he mentioned this a lot here over the last week, only wanting to hire guys based upon relationships or recommendations, right? I think that that's important to him. 
and finding people he trusts to give him those. And he clearly trusts Pat Shermer. Pat Shermer's coming back. So I mean, he, he clearly has to have, you know, over the last several months, Shermer has had to have earned his trust to the point where, you know, he can make that kind of a recommendation. Because I yeah. imagine that's where it well, came from. I think the most telling comment that Coach Prime had the whole time that he was continually asked about Shermer and the play calling situation is that uh, he said that Shadour and Pat Shermer get along really, really well, that they right. mesh really, really well. I thought that was kind of the main point as he was going through the progression of answering that question that kind of stood out to me is that there's a comfort level there that, um, you know, folks that are Broncos fans and uh, have that PTSD are, uh, sure. are not too excited about the proposition of him being the play caller next year. And I would be hard to, to buck back on that too much because not only of what happened with the Broncos, but you know, it's not like they were lighting the scoreboard up late in the season. And I, I understand all the issues Shador being completely banged up and all the protection issues. I, I get all that, but um, you still would have liked to see just a little bit more out of that offense. I think the last uh, month of the season to feel really good about that going into 2024 being the arrangement. So, um, you know, that's, there's going to be people that are going to be skeptical about, uh, Shermer as a play caller all off season. And that's going to be one of the, the headlining things I think leading up to, to next season, if that isn't do, indeed what coach prime decides to do, but he hasn't completely a hundred percent solidified that that's the decision, right? As we record this. Yeah. He, he said, most likely, I think I've heard him say it twice now that that's most likely. And he kind of alluded to, well, maybe something else can happen. So maybe they're trying to talk to somebody else and maybe Shermer is a backup plan as of now. I'm not exactly sure. Um, it's not like Shermer has a lot of leverage in the matter, right? I mean, this would be a huge job for him to be able to be the OC for Shadur Sanders heading into his senior year. And now with whatever else, you know, with, with whatever talent, other talent they're going to get and Travis Hunter. Oh, by the way, it was funny that you bring up, you're, you're never going to appease Broncos fans with the hiring of Shermer. It's just not going to happen. Like we were during a break today, I had a couple of people, a producer and and one of the other hosts come in and ask me about Shermer because they were curious of my opinion. And I, you know, calmly explained what my take was. And then walking into the studio was this uh, ne uh, another producer who's a giant Broncos fan. That's like he lives and breathes orange and blue. OK. And he goes, what are you guys talking about? Oh, Shermer. Ugh. Ugh. And I was just like, yeah, see, nothing I could say to you would justify that because of your preconceived notion. Right. So I'm not even going to try to be honest with you. And to be, because here's the thing, even if I did, he's going to have to have the results that back it up enough to the point where, you know, he proves it to, to win a bunch of those people over. I Here's how I would say the Shermer, and maybe this is just me, but this is how I would evaluate that. If he is in fact the guy, is he the best possible option i can't confidently say that i can't is he the safest yeah he is because as you mentioned he gets along really well with shadur he proved towards the back half of the year that and prime mentioned this in an interview he did the other day i can't remember where but he said look that wasn't even his scheme you know he was coming in running sean lewis's scheme which i think there's probably some truth to that as well but I think he demonstrated an ability to actually scheme and coach with what he had and show improvement. Sean Lewis never really schemed things differently. He didn't really adjust what they were doing based upon their personnel. Pat was able to do that. The we Arizona game is the best example, I think, to go back and rewatch uh, to see some of those concepts that, OK, that you could kind of talk me into a little bit more if you watch that game. I thought was kind of the best display yeah. of it. Well, Zelenskis, right? I mean, for the love yeah. of God, Shadur's been getting killed all year. They didn't have a tight end who could block, and it wasn't until Shermer took control of the reins that they put, uh, you know, another lineman as a tight end just to get them help in the run game and the pass game. And then you look at what he did for the Utah affair, starting Ryan Staub, his first career start. I thought outside of one play in the first half, he called the perfect first half. We saw some creativity. We saw the first wide receiver pass. Right. With Jimmy Horn. We didn't even know that we've been waiting all year for Travis to throw. Right. It, 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 the only play I didn't love was the first down the play action where Staub ended up fumbling. I thought, you know, you're marching down, just run the ball there. But outside of that, Adam, it was pretty good. 
And I don't know if they're necessarily going to be the most dynamic offense in the country under Shermer. That I can't guarantee because I think just based upon the track record of what I've seen at the NFL level, he was never overly creative. However, I don't know that they have to be. They have to be more balanced, though. They have to be able to commit to running the football and commit to their protection schemes. And having that history that Shermer has as an offensive line coach, I'm sure factored heavily into part of what Prime was thinking about to even remotely keep him around this year because the number one priority is to protect Shadur. I also think a big priority is to prepare Shadur for the NFL. An astute point that was brought up in our season recap was they run a college offense, right? That was part of the disconnect between Sean Lewis and Shadur. Shadur needs to be under center more. He needs to be doing, I mean, hell, use some pistol. Use different things formationally to get him more acclimated to what he's going to see at the next level, and I don't think the offense this year was representative of it under Sean Lewis whatsoever. Now, did it really get better back half of the year as far as that specific aspect, gearing him up towards the NFL with Shermer? Not really. There was a marginal amount, but with his scheme, if he ends up being the guy next year, then I think, you know, fresh fresh set of eyes. He's got the established relationship. There's trust built. I understand why they would go that route, and I'm okay with it. But I'll say this. I'll say this. The argument for the fan base, if it doesn't go well, is predetermined. Right? Right. And I don't know if I'm talked into it yet, Matt. I I still have my reservations there. So I am Did anxious. you hear me talking myself into it? I, I could hear you trying to, and it, it, it <laughs> felt like you had almost broken through by the end of what you were saying. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that, that the reason they would make that move, I, I, I struggle to hear an argument that he'd be the best option. He, he hasn't coached a college for 25 years. Not saying it doesn't disqualify him, but I do see the argument for him being the safest option, right? I don't think he's things are going to melt down under his control. Yeah. How much, now let me ask you this, how much does recruiting factor in for an offensive coordinator? It's important that... Uh you're better scheme wise and that you have a reputation and then your position recruiter can kind of be the the guy that sells you on coming to that school because coordinators have more on their plate. Now there are some coordinators that are pretty good recruiters, but generally they spend less time on the road recruiting than the average coach. Just again, they have more stuff on their plate that they've got to deal with. And so having that reputation and that's kind of what we expected with Sean Lewis coming in that, you know, that reputation was, uh, it was stellar coming in and it just, it hindsight being 2020, it just wasn't a great fit. And I still think he's going to have a lot of success. It's San Diego state. It just um, it's one of those things. It, it should have been more clear that maybe should do her and, and, and Sean Lewis weren't a perfect marriage that, that there were uh, his system and, and what should trying to get out of his college experience and trying to get to that's not meshing. And um, I, I think it is, pretty clear looking back that Shadour did not like playing at that pace. Right. I think that's pretty, pretty fair to say. I think it's fair to say, especially when you can't run the ball. I mean, that was the drum that I was beating the first five weeks of the season. When the hyper tempo offense doesn't go well, you race yourself off the field and they didn't have the run game nor the defense to support it, especially early on going three and out, three and out, three and out and allowing opposing offenses so many extra possessions. And I think if they were more balanced, right and you had more cohesion among a team that had been together for several years then it makes more sense because everybody's probably on the same page but i i was very critical of the way they finished the usc game and i remember talking to shadur because they got the ball back i think it was like 540 left on the clock and they needed two touchdowns and they took their sweet time moving down the field when in that moment it needs to be two minute drill we're going here's the play i'm not checking out of it But Shadur mentioned to us in the press conference, what do you want me to do, run a play when nobody's going to run the right play? Like, how am I going to snap the ball and everybody's just going to run the wrong play? So I I, I see both sides of it there. The reason I bring up the recruiting aspect is because, look, on a personal level, I actually really like Pat. I've met him this year. He seems like a really nice guy. Every time I've talked to him, it's been a pleasant conversation. I will say, I think that he's re-energized being – in college like I think maybe for him the NFL had gotten stale when he first arrived 
I remember him, you know, being a little tentative because he just spent 25 years primarily as a position coach, a coordinator, or a head coach in the NFL. And now here he is, a college analyst, right, just trying to figure something else out. And I think he didn't really understand at the beginning, but I think as he spent more and more time around these kids that he kind of just got re-energized. And the person I saw at the end of the year had a ton of fire. Like, I'll remember him coming out of the booth when we're sitting up there in Utah being fired up that they took those two Travis touchdowns off the board. And it was just... That's a guy who cared the way I heard it. You know what I mean? And look, do I think he's the best choice? I don't know. I'll tell you this. When he was the OC for the Broncos, I was definitely extremely critical. Okay, so I don't want to be a hypocrite and say, oh, no, I I, I could see why you do it now and say, well, I don't know why he was fired. I know why he was fired. I know why, because they could not figure it out offensively. in Denver. Now, there was a lot of other stuff going on there, but he certainly wasn't great in Denver. I think he's had a top 13 offense four times in the NFL. It's an okay number. He's worked a long time in the NFL, right? I just, I look at it and I go, you're drawing a lot from guys who don't necessarily, from a coaching perspective, at least, Lodeholt, maybe Shermer, you go down the list of some of these other guys that maybe have more experience at the NFL level than they do at the college level. And how well does that translate? I think it remains to be seen, but I don't think it's a disqualifier. This season just ended. Like I said, we haven't even gotten our recap shows out there. Uh, all this news is happening. I would imagine it's just this is as long as Coach Prime's around, we just are going to have a lot of emergency pods. Even uh, yeah. season two of Coach Prime just drops. You're you're now looking back, and man, they they jammed so much into those first two episodes. It was, it, I was watching parts of camp, and I I turned to my wife and said, "Man, that feels like a year ago. That doesn't feel like." Three four months ago, it, it was it was a great it was a great experience covering the season, but the end of it was draining on everybody. You know. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was emotional, right? I mean, it was just like highs and lows, and okay, you know, and traveling, and you know, back to back to Washington State and Utah at the end of the year. I haven't seen them yet. I'm looking forward to seeing them. To me, training camp feels like yesterday, but it also feels like a year ago. You know, yeah, I just yeah. think this this whole experience has been such a whirlwind that I remember getting home from Utah and thinking, oh, I'll have a little more free time now, like a little bit more, maybe not so fast, but a little bit more. And, you know, you kind of breathe and then, okay, here we go again, sportsman of the year. And now here's Jordan Seaton. And okay, he's going to keep Shermer. And I, I have a feeling, especially now with Jordan Seaton committed and, you know, I know there's, what is it? December 20th is 13 days away. I imagine yeah, that's when he would sign, right? Presumably. Yes. Yes, because he's going to be an early enrollee. So, yes. So, I mean, I would hope nothing else happens in the next 13 days. I imagine that with a guy like him, you make a commit. You don't do, you know, change it with 13. I believe all that needs to happen is he gets uh, to meet his new position coach in person during in home is kind of the. Okay. uh, There's there's from what I kind of understand, there's not a whole lot to, to be concerned about. And it is making me now reflect on on how real some of these NIL rumors are, because. I heard that we were hearing that two million was the the rumored number for Jordan Seaton with Oregon. Uh, that number seemed high. Um, I, I know fifty four thirty foundations doing great work, and they're not going to publicize uh, what happens on that side of it. But yeah, it, it, the new reality of college football sometimes it, it's just more fun not to to pay as close of attention and just be happy that these young men are getting <laughs> something. You know, instead of all the the coaches reaping all the benefits, but man, that that two million number is it, it is crazy. If there's any truth to that at all, yeah, that was one thing that I mentioned in my reaction on the air. You know, I, clearly this has been in the works for more than just the last few days. But I said maybe somebody came in eleventh hour with a big donation or a bunch of money. I don't know, Adam, and I'm sure whoever's watching this that was involved is laughing at us at the moment in time. But as far as I know, outside of a starting quarterback. You know, offensive linemen are probably the highest priced kids or or transfers that you're going to find, at least starters. So I'd imagine that a lot of it was monetary related. I mean, I know well, that too many I know I know that I know that Coach Prime. In a perfect world, NIL wouldn't exist unless you were uh, sure. the Travis Hunters of the world. Um, but we've also seen him soften up about NIL stuff, and it's clear that he understands now. If I want to be playing in this 12-team yeah. college football playoff going forward, you know, there's really no way around it. You've got to 
with some of these guys play this game because it is the new landscape. And even Rick George has really come around. And, um, you know, I was critical of him early in the NIL stages. And I got it from his standpoint that he was on the board that put out, put in all these guardrails that were sp- supposed to be put in to keep NIL from being used as an inducement, which was kind of a silly thought to begin with. But the fact that the NCAA basically said all this work that you guys did, we're going to put it on a shelf and we're not going to implement anything. And it's down to each state to decide created the wild, wild West. And I get how Rick George would be like kind of miffed and annoyed and be like, well, screw that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, But he's come around and they've got more support now. And uh, they're really trying to take advantage of this era that they have with coach prime. I don't know what those numbers look like, um, I'd love I, to know. Gosh, I would, I'd love to down know. Down the road, hopefully, that's something that uh, yeah. you know people are more willing to talk about. But it's it's still, even though it's legal, it's still a gray area, right? And so yeah. you're you're that's, not going to. That's why I said, you know, just yeah, close your yeah, eyes and watch. Yeah, it. You yeah. know, just proceed, please. Um, I, I, you know, I kind of go back to what Prime said at the end of the Utah press conference. He said some kids cost, and I think throughout recruiting this year they've probably run up against that battle several different times where some kids probably came back wanting more money after originally committing. I'm just guessing. I don't know. And then you probably also were never even in the conversation in some kids because you probably just didn't have the money on the table that some other schools had. And he probably lost or at least wasn't in the conversation for some players. And eventually he learned, he's like, well, look, I mean, if we're going to play with the big boys, we got to have the resources to do so. But I got to say, as a Colorado fan, man, this feels mighty encouraging that you had the resources to land Jordan Seaton. Yeah. Yeah, I I can confirm that last year when they did their elite underclassmen recruiting weekend, there were two guys that I talked to personally that couldn't have raved more about their time in Boulder. And I later found out when they dropped CU from consideration that it was indeed the NIL that they were kind of weeding that out at that point. But um, that, that is definitely part of the process. Now uh, you've got to now figure out um, with this collective, uh, is this yeah. all allocated to certain positions? What? And I think linebacker, they, they need uh some help to land a real elite guy at that position. We talked about that on one of our recap shows and you still probably need a couple more offense linemen. Now it's going to be tougher. The more Jordan Seaton's of the world you land, it's going to be hard to get more of them to commit because they want to all play. Right. But Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, you need some depth there. I I, I like the ability of saving on Washington. I think Tyler Brown's going to be competing for a starting guard spot. I think Jordan Seaton is going to find a way into that starting lineup. Um, and so you've got some other pieces that you're, you're kind of working with, but there's still some work to be done there. Yeah. I just, I mean, are they going to find a bunch more starters? Like to the point where Seton's not even in the conversation. I got to think Adam, that if he's coming here, it's to play right away. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, whether or not that's a left tackle or at a guard position, I, I don't know. We're going to find out more. We'll be able to piece some of the puzzle together more with who else they get, but you, you know, you're in this, you're entrenched in this every day. How much does a commit like this turn the heads of other kids who have Colorado on their list? It matters. Good players really do want to play with other good players. And there is a, a momentum that you see, and you could potentially see this happen in, in these next couple of weeks leading up to that early signing period where Jordan Seaton gets a boot Carter to kind of rethink things and mm. go, gosh, I, I could be another piece of this puzzle and and you know you, you never know what's going to sure. strike a young man that they could just tune into coach prime season two and for whatever reason there's something in there they see that changes their mindset leading up to signing day so um the one thing i i saw one of our national recruiting analysts say and i thought it was a good point is that you know, with colorado and as long as coach prime is a head coach in colorado you always have to keep an eye on them if they're in the mix mm-hmm. for a recruit and um, you know, sometimes like today, it's going to be more of a left out of left field type of announcement. Cormani McLean was kind of a surprise yeah. last year when he flipped. And so um, they're good at what they do when it comes to recruiting. And now we'll see if, you know, those uh, coaching changes that are being made is what's going to allow them. I, I have no doubt that when is all said and done, Matt, this is going to be one of the better transfer classes coming in this year. They this is the strength of this coaching staff. Uh, as we saw last winter and not every one of those guys panned out. Um, But if you get as many 
of the guys you bring in on the O line to pan out as you did on the D line, you're at least going to have a mid level group that you can work with. You know, sure. it's not going to be a, a Chinese fire drill out there behind center. So, <laughs> right. right. Uh, I, I, you know, there's guys like Hank Zelinskis. What, what is his future? You know, yeah. he, he was put into a, a tough spot as a true freshman playing this year. And can he make a jump? And so, that's I, I do love all the the different aspects of the off season where you uh, it's kind of like putting a, a puzzle together. And uh, a few days ago, Colorado fans were uh, getting a, a little ago. frustrated. A S- little six frustrated. hours ago, <laughs> but uh, today on <laughs> Thursday, December seventh, we have some good news to to talk about. And uh, Matt, that we went longer than I was anticipating, but that was fun just to kind of run through some different topics. And we still have another season recap show to get up. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. The one one last thing I wanted to ask you, if that's okay, before we yeah. got out of here, um, you know, just because you're entrenched with this as much as you are, what do you think a commit like this does to national perception for people in the recruiting business? Because I think in people in the media business now, people are going to ease off the pressure of saying, why is it all going to hell for Colorado, right? I mean, that's done. I mean, even I this morning had to answer that question. Mike asked me, and I was like, no, everything's fine. This It's normal attrition. Wake me up when they lose somebody on their too deep, right? You know, wake me up when they lose a coach that I think is irreplaceable, which, by the way, doesn't exist on the team. So I, I outside of maybe Coach Prime himself, I, I just look at it like, yeah, I feel like all of that, is this over? All that stuff, we're done with that now, right? Yeah, no, and, and they will continue to add pieces, like I said. I, I feel very confident in that, but – um, you know, it's, I guess it's the part of the, the fun of being a fan is that you get to sure. overreact to things and, uh, take it out on your, your favorite writer if you need to. But what but, about Nash? What about nationally? Like, what about some of these guys who have been very critical of how he's handled things? Does, does a commit like this go a long way to changing their mind or at I least- don't know what it is about coach prime, but he really gets people entrenched in, in sometimes in not, in, not in a way where okay, Coach Prime is the best coach to be uh, leading Colorado's football program. He has amazing strengths as a human being. I've been impressed with X, Y, Z, but you can also talk about, okay, well, they need to do a better job here and there. And some people just get really resistant when you do that with Coach Prime. And I I had never seen that before with another head coach. But then on the flip side of it, you have people that will spin any stat – that will lead to them okay. showing that coach prime is overrated. Uh, and they seem to get off on that. And it, it's kind of weird to me. There's not a whole lot of people, but the people that are like that are very vocal. And every time they do it, uh, it's kind of like, you know, I, I, we feed the trolls a little bit too much, right. Is what we're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just feel like when you land a kid like this, it's kind of undeniable. My biggest question heading into the off season is how would they spin or sell, even though I know he says he doesn't sell, how would they, you know, explain away losing eight of their last nine and finishing zero and six? I thought that that could be a challenge for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I thought that might deter some people, but I feel like it's a huge sign to me getting a kid like this that they figured out a way. Yeah, it it was year one, and nobody wants to hear that. I don't even want to even say it. But very true. Very. I mean, true. We, when you look at it, uh, I mean. People sure love Jed Fish down in Tucson now. Uh, and <laughs> they didn't before. You know, that's part of why Coach Prime having the message when he came in, he created these expectations and then they became a victim of those expectations. And as a media member, you're sitting back there going, watching this mm-hmm. all go down. You're like, man, like the expectation, I thought they would go six and six. I did really feel right. like they had enough talent on the team. I still think they should they, have. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, the the wide range of expectations, and it was it was kind of a, an interesting seat this year to see all of the the different facets going from national media, who we really hadn't dealt with a whole lot, right. you know, in recent yeah. years. It's like, oh, I yeah, I know that face. That's Adam Rittenberg. Okay, like you yeah. know, there were a yeah. lot of national writers around this year that we had never seen before, and and that that's cool. It's great that Colorado gets that exposure, but. Man, you got a you got a lot of wild takes out there now. Not yeah. Adam Rittenberg. He's he's one of the, the yeah, good he was ones one of the guys there, that knows. But, yeah, yeah, like Bomani, like Bomani Jones, I heard the other day talking about what a massive loss losing their top recruiter, Tim Brewster, was and how many and I'm you know, how many kids are leaving. I was like, 
I don't know that you have that one all the way correct, but it's fun to watch these national personalities try and come at it. But really, they kind of out themselves eventually. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can, you're like, oh, OK, you either know what you're talking about or you don't. And in that case, in that instance, I was like, no, you, you got that one way, way, way off there. He, he didn't leave because he wasn't happy. He, he didn't leave because he wanted to get the hell out. He, leave cause, he left because he got demoted. He wanted, He went and got a better job. Like. And I think it's funny that a lot of people, even Jim Rome kind of setting up Sean Lewis when he had him on his show a couple days ago, asking him if he regretted coming to Boulder, people are trying to get that story, right? They're trying to set up people to get that story. But I'll give Prime this. He has been consistent from day one that he wants his coaches to get better jobs. He's in full support of it. And that's part of the reason why he brought in former head coaches and coaches with good reputations so he could help elevate them. He has never once said, oh, I'm terrified of losing that guy or, you know, who cares about, you know, him getting another job? No, it's he's trying to lift everybody up, which I think is important, especially when you have to kind of balance it against getting a highly you know, thought after name in Sean Lewis and then demoting him halfway through year one. You kind of have to combat that a little bit. So interesting. There's. I mean, I assume since we talked about Pat Shermer as much, by the time you get this uploaded, there'll be somebody else's OC, right? <laughs> Without fail, I still have yet to hear back from William Gardner. And I was joking with you that I, I think once the uh, Jordan Seaton news came down, he just started getting half na- naked celebrating yeah. down the yeah. 16th Street Mall. And so I don't know. I, I want to do want to leave some meat on the bone for, for William yeah. whenever whenever he turns up. I, oh, I don't he'll know have more gonna... than me. He'll bring more than me. You already know that. I couldn't even possibly begin to eat all the meat off that bone. <laughs> but I can't wait to to hear what his his reaction was to this commitment because uh, he, he suffered did. through a lot of, as uh, as our resident offensive line guru and and this right. was a big get. Uh, Matt, always appreciate your contributions. Thanks for tuning in, everybody out there on short short notice. Uh, I don't know. It's starting to feel like this might be a multiple emergency podcast type off season for the Buffalo uh, multiple. Yeah, that's, I think, I hope so. Knock on wood, Adam, hopefully you got a reason to see you tomorrow. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. We'll see you. Thanks everybody out there for tuning in.